This week, there is no book to turn the pages on. Instead, I have just finished watching a film and turned off the TV. After a few weeks of struggling with the books, which I have mentioned previously, I am turning to a book to screen adaptation and being bookish is going to the movies. Yes, you heard me right. I'm headed to my Disney Plus subscription. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile, though not this week, and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. Again, no spoiler-free this week. It's all spoilers all the time when we talk film. As I've already mentioned, this week it's all about film. So join me and my guest as we talk The Devil Wears Prada, starring Meryl Streep, Anne Hathaway, Stanley Tucci and Emily Blunt. Andy, played by Anne Hathaway, is a recent college graduate with big dreams of being a journalist. Upon landing a job at the prestigious Runway magazine for fashion, she finds herself the assistant to diabolical editor-in-chief Miranda Priestley, played by Meryl Streep. Andy constantly questions her ability to survive her grim tour as Miranda's whipping girl without getting scorched in an industry she has no experience of. Joining me at the movies because... Yeah, books just weren't happening this week, unless you wanted to hear me talking about Joanna Lindsay for about seven hours, <laughs> is Lorraine from Once Upon a Nightmare. I think Lorraine is a regular guest, so if you don't know her yet, Lorraine, tell everyone about yourself. Yep, I do come on here a lot. Uh, I'm uh, Lorraine from Once Upon a Nightmare, and I talk about horror movies and sometimes true crime. So, yeah. So completely different to what Ray does. <laughs> Although you do do some horror <laughs> oh. books. I have done some horror and it's one of those genres that I read a lot more than I talk about. And I have got the latest Hello. Stephen King on my bookcase right now, though that's oh, not really horror, apparently. That. Yeah, it's, what, Stephen it's King? a big book. Fairy tale. Oh. It is. It, oh, it is, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite large. It is quite a, um, a hefty tome, to say the least. Anyway, this week we are, t I am talking about with my guest, uh, The Devil Wears Prada, the 2006 film starring the fantastic as ever Meryl Streep and one mm. of my favorite actors, Stanley Tucci, who I will eternally declare love for because there is just something about him in everything. And if you've listened to my episode on, uh, oh my God, why can't I remember the name of the the film with Emma Stone, uh, you will know that I absolutely love him. I don't know what it is about him. There is just something about him that's amazing. I've never heard so, anyone say anything negative about him. I, I don't like think I have. Too. Yeah, no. I don't think I have either. Yeah, he's one of those. There is just something just, about him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very, um, very appealing. He's kind of like the guy when you watch it, you just want him to be your best friend. Exactly. And no. in this, that is kind of what he ends up becoming in many ways. Mm. Nigel's character. Yeah. He's he's lovely. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> The Devil Wears Prada came out in 2006 and is based on a book, which is why I thought this would be a pretty a good one. And it was actually Lorraine's suggestion because I was earlier this week going, I haven't read anything much. What am I going to talk about on Saturday? <laughs> And I was I was panicking just a tiny bit. Okay, quite a lot. Uh, and Lorraine <laughs> suggested The Devil Wears Prada, so it's perfect. Why did you pick this book apart uh, this film apart from the fact that it is a book? Well, when we were chatting, because like Ray said, she's just like anyone that knows Ray's podcast, she reads a lot. I mean, it, it's not natural. And uh, <laughs> there's hey. a. Well, I think it's freaking weird. And I know that there's people that read a lot more than you, but I, I just, it's not, not weird. I just don't know how you do it. 
I just I, I'd be in a continuous state of sleep if I read that much because when I read it makes me sleepy. But anyway, so I thought, you know, you're not going to get a book done. That's fine. Let's draw a line in that. And then I was like, why don't we do a film based on a book? Because, you know, it's still book related. And I just when I was talking to you, we were having a Zoom chat about it and I was talking to you. I was actually Googling films based on books. And I, I was like, look, look, look. And I says, I could I could do something like I'd like to do something lighthearted because I'm horror. I was like, I don't want to go straight for a horror one because I do that all the time. So I saw Devil Wears Prada and I was like, I, I love that film and any excuse to talk about it or watch it and stuff again. So very selfish re- reasons. <laughs> That's why I picked that one because I wanted to do it. <laughs> and I can on mine. <laughs> yeah. And it is a good, it is a good film. And it is oh, so semi-biographical because Meryl Streep's cra- character, Miranda Priestley, is based Anna very, very before. loosely, yes, on Anna Winter, yeah. who is mm. English, uh, the uh, chief, uh, the editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine and has been since 1988, which is an incredibly is long she time still? to be in. Yeah, an incredibly yeah. long time to be in a role. And it was, it was one of those films you sit there and you think, how did they get away with so much of this? And apparently Anna Winter eventually saw the film and she was okay with it. But a lot of designers refused to appear in it for fear they were going to, for fear they were going to anger Anna Winter. Though they did let them use their clothing. Yeah, and the na- a few names popped up, you know, and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, names which, popped which, up, but they didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I saw that. Um, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> See, the thing is, say you saying that, like they were worried about um, how she'd react and all that kind of stuff, that to me wouldn't tie in with the character of Miranda Pleasley because she's such a... I just don't give a like. I mean, the way she yeah. speaks to people is dia- is despicable. You you do not treat people the way she treats people. Everyone in this film is pretty much a dick. Like, do you know what I mean? Apart from one yeah. or two, the way they talk to people. So, in that sense, if I if this is based off of like Anna Winter, I'd be like, Anna Winter is not going to give a shit because she owns it. Like, oh, she Miranda absolutely Priestley owns makes it. no um no uh, excuses for what what she's like. So Anna Winter would be like, yeah. That's what I'm like. Get over it. You know? That's I mean, that's the thing. Miranda Priestley definitely owns her boss bitch persona one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I one thing I will say is I am flabbergasted. I didn't like Andy at the beginning of this film at all. Because hmm. she came across as okay, for anybody who doesn't know the film, it's about Andy, who is a recent journalism graduate from Northwestern University. She moved to New York to become a journalist and she has sent out her CV to everywhere. Nobody wants to know because she hasn't got any experience. She ends up going to this big publishing house where they refer her to Runway Magazine and she gets the job as Miranda Priestley, the editor-in-chief's second assistant, working alongside Emily who is played by Emily Blunt, who is absolutely desperate for a leg up, but only Mm. insofar as she wants to become exactly like Miranda. She loves working in Mm. the fashion industry and she loves everything about it. Whereas Andy is less interested. She sees it as a stepping stone to something better. Mm. And this is where I had a problem with her character because she walks into this job interview She hasn't taken any time to get to know anything about the job, about the person she might be working for. She is incredibly dismissive of the industry, almost like she's thumbing her nose at it. And when I saw this, I mean, it had been a while since I saw it. And when I watched it this morning, all I could think was, I wouldn't hire you. Because you are coming in here incredibly arrogant and, oh, well, I'm so much better. Why would I know anything about this? And when she's laughing under her breath when they're talking about the color and the style of those two belts in a later scene, it was like, they're not wrong when they say a million other people would want this stepping stone in a career path. And you are basically saying, oh, this doesn't matter. It's not important. 
Um, yeah, I, I, some of that I'm with and some of that I'd be a bit like her. Um, so yeah, I did, to be honest with you, it's a bit unclear, I think at the start, because when she comes in first, I kind of got the impression that she had been through the interviewing process that she, you know, like the way we would go for an interview and get a job and because she wasn't dressed like she was going for an interview, you know what I mean? And then, but then Miranda pulls her in and kind of has a bit of a word with her and I think it's okay. I mean, yeah, she should have done, like, she should have heard about Miranda. Because the fact when Miranda Priestley goes, and up until today, you'd never heard of me. And yeah, then her I'm friend going... tells her that evening, oh, well, you'd be lucky to work for her. She's this, that, and the other. Yeah. It's like, he's yeah. heard of her. And he exactly. works in so, a completely different industry. Well, exactly. Why so have not... Exactly. But, but not having heard of her, that didn't bother me. But it's the fact that she should have by then. So had she, you know, went for the interview, she's like, I'm going to work in runway, do a little, you know, a little bit of research. So that I thought, yeah, it was really sloppy, really sloppy way to get a job. With regards to the colour, I probably would have sniggered when someone showed me two identical colours. I like, I think what it was, it wasn't when she went, if she had just went, oh, these two belts, you know, they're a bit different because they were slightly, I, the buckles were different or something. I don't know yeah. which one to pick that I could get on board with. But when she said about the color, she went, it's just like, they're so different. Like the, the I would have laughed. I would have been that idiot, that twat that went, <laughs> they're both blue. I think you were like, owning it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like that would have I bothered think, me. So would you have been inc- so arrogant to have gone into somewhere and said, oh, well, it was either this or auto whatever it was, auto trader, where it wasn't auto trader. No, but I but... think that's what she says at the start to Miranda. Is that what she yeah, says to Miranda? But she'd but already yeah. been, what she'd done is with these bigger conglomerate companies, from what mm. I can gather, they interview with HR, with the HR department. Oh yeah, because she personnel. kept saying HR sure do have a funny sense. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Because yeah. they basically, they will screen somebody for their qualifications but in HR, they're not going to be thinking, oh, well, they would be perfect because they know how to dress or anything. They're thinking of the qualification aspect and the experience yeah. aspect rather than the they know how to dress. They know Prada from Gucci. And when she asked them how to spell Gabbana, it was like I actually kind yeah. of cringed for her just a little bit. How does it? Yeah, that was quite funny. But I think with regards to the auto thing, I, I actually think she was smart there because that's what grabbed her attention because she walked in and you know Miranda would be used to people coming and going oh my god I think you're amazing I love this designer and this style blah 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 blah, and all this kind of stuff bullshit like all bullshit because when let's face it when we go for interviews we tell them what we think they want to hear most oh yeah of the absolutely the job and for most interviews you're going to you're getting that job because you need to pay your bills you know it's not like you're going into your dream job and she wasn't and she knew she couldn't bullshit Miranda obviously in you know in the role so she just went look yeah I'm not this and I think that's what was probably a bit different for Miranda that it wasn't someone blowing smoke up her ass it was someone going look I need a bloody job I want to do something else and you know that actually in the end got her pulled back you know that's why you want Emily asked her to come back yeah I do think that there are certain moments where you do where you think, oh, that that doesn't matter to me. And it's like, well, maybe it doesn't, but mm. for the sake of your job, I mean, there are certain things. I used to, I, I think everybody has had one of those jobs where they've had to pretend to care about something that they really oh, God, yeah. couldn't give a toss about. Yeah. Have, if somebody was saying it's talking about it in the street, you'd walk away from them and you pretend yeah. for your job that you care about it. And I think that was for me the issue with her to start with was that she was so dismissive and, oh, this doesn't matter to anybody else. And it's kind of, to a point, I agree. I mean, I am, as you know, I am Miss What's Comfortable. I am the, if it's comfortable, I'll wear it person. But I can still appreciate a beautifully designed dress and a gorgeous pair of shoes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I would have no interest in that, but like that industry. But if you're going to work in it, then you know have a bit and not only that it's also a leg up because she's working for someone who is notoriously difficult everybody knows that she's difficult and 
if you can cope with that, you can cope with pretty much anything. The thing is, though, like in that environment that they were in, I mean, I, I could handle the actual work side of it. You know, yeah. the the being the assistant and all that kind of stuff. That that bit went. We've all me. done it at some point. Yeah, exactly. That bit fine. It was the way they all acted. Like at first, when I first hear, "Oh my God, she's coming!" Oh, she's she's early, and everyone's like changing their shoes, putting lipstick on, panic, manic, oh, and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, "You all need to calm the f- down." Like, do you know what I mean? Like, no job is worth you panicking like that it's just not worth it if you, if cuz like can you imagine those people stress they're probably all dead by 30 because of stress like it was just ridiculous and i don't think anybody in this world has a right to expect people to act like that i think like i would not in a million years work for someone like um that i'd be like get over yourself like i have no problem respecting someone and you know if they're they i mean what she's achieved is amazing just like anna wintour but you don't get to treat me like crap because of it see and that, that's what that she's, was just, the, she's so disrespectful that yeah. woman i mean that was the interesting thing when she's having the conversation when andy is meeting for dinner with christian who yeah i actually yeah there was there was definite chemistry between those two but when she was having mm. dinner with him and she says nobody would say anything if she were a man. Oh, it's very true. Very true. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think that is part one of the things that the film is highlighting. The difference between how men operate and are accepted and how women operate and are accepted in the same industry. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't offer that. Yeah, I no, I get all that. But I wouldn't accept that from a man or a woman. That behavior but, like is despicable. It's despicable. Like, you know get over yourself like just I have no time for people (laughs) who you know expect this this fear from someone and the worst thing is Miranda's not happy like she barely cracks a smile during the whole film and she's like coming in and she's like throwing her coat and she's like like she wants something and it's like oh do I have to wait surely move her a glacier like everything is like I need it now I need it now I need it now and like like two seconds is too long you know, so even yeah. for her and the way she, and the way she, she reacts when she's stuck in Miami and mm. she wants to get back for her children's oh. recital. I mean, it's quite obvious that she cares for her children a lot, mm. though there are certain things that I question um, being a good mother on. But there are certain things where she was so desperate to get home to her daughters to see their recital that Mm. she was willing to torment Andy to the point where you could almost see that she was going to have a nervous breakdown. Yeah, because she was like, it's just drizzling out, basically. What's wrong? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you can see the lightning and the fact that there's a hurricane, a tornado warning and all of those things. And you could see the the anxiety in her dad's eyes because they were at dinner with... They were at dinner together. It was the first time they'd seen each other since she moved to New York. She had the weekend off. She wasn't on call. Yeah, and because Miranda was on hol- Miranda was away in Miami doing something, and all of a sudden, sudden Miranda's calling her on her evening off, demanding that she get her home from Miami because all the flights have been cancelled. And you've got to look at it this way as well. Perform a miracle. Yeah, but you've got to look at this way as well. Is demanding that means that somebody has to go out there, get you to the airport, and then fly you home. So there, you're putting lives at risk. Yeah, but she doesn't care yeah. about that. Well, exactly. It's this entitlement. Like, you know, fair play to anyone working your way up the ladder where you become that position. Yeah. But have a bit of bloody grace. You know, I thought I just the whole setup, like and the, I, I find it really funny when because remember, she was like, really, I was really disappointed. And, you know, yes. I went against everything and went, you know, hire the smart fat girl. And I was like, fat that? girl she's, yeah exactly I thought when I that line I I laughed I proper laughed when she said that because you know Mar- uh, Andy is looked at as the fat girl like which is just but ridiculous she's tiny. in itself but then I it's a, then it's an accomplishment at the end where she's talking with Nigel and she and he says oh you're you're size six ass and she says size four and I'm thinking yeah because you've had a nervous breakdown and you've starved yourself yeah, because Emily's like, oh, I don't eat anything. And then when I feel like I'm good, Emily, I feel like I'm going to faint. I have a block of cheese. And she goes, well, not it's not even what, a block. Oh, she has a cube. A cube of cheese. Yeah. And she's like all and excited. And I'm one stomach it's flew away from me. <laughs> I know. Zero. I mean, like, the oh whole, my God. 
the whole thing is just ridiculous. It is. It's, I mean, I not for a, any amount of money would I work in that office. I, I wouldn't well, last two minutes, to be honest with you. They, they'd fire me because I just would be like, would you all shut up and calm down? <laughs> I see, just this, would have no this, patience. That's the thing. I, I, was, I was watching this and I was thinking there are quite a few similarities between this and the TV series Ugly Betty. I've never seen Which that. came out at the same time. They actually yeah. both. I know started, what it is. But I've never seen it yet. Yeah, this one, uh, the film came out in two thousand and six, and the f- series started in two thousand and six. And mm. basically, it is um, Betty starts working. She's a ju- she also wanted to be a journalist, and she mm. gets a plum job as the assistant to the editor in chief of this magazine. Mm. And he doesn't want her there. And the reason they've hired her is because she won't attract him because he keeps on sleeping with his assistants. So she is nothing like any of the other people that work in the office. Can you imagine being that pathetic? Like that much of a loser that you hire someone that you're not attracted with because you... (sighs) Oh, no, he doesn't hire her. Her, His father does. His father owns the business and he hires her. Because he knows that his son will not sleep with her. And the only you know irony what? being, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the entirety of it, he, does he ends up, yeah, he ends up falling in love with her anyway. It's just, ugh, God, I was chatting to my mum the other day because I, I work for myself and I'm on my own a lot. And she goes, why? I says, because of people. And this is it, people. Yes. Like your dad has to hire someone that he doesn't think you're, you're shag. Like, Jesus Christ. It's so ridiculous. It's so who are these people? Like, do you know what I mean? It's just But that was it. I I part of me thinks that Emily was okay with Andy's hire because she didn't see her as a threat. A threat. Yeah. And then the as soon she as she in, becomes yeah. a threat, yeah. she is a bit she's a little bit more cautious about accepting her for anything. But I found mm. Emily's character interesting. Because there was something about her, you all the time she was kind of like this peripheral character, but she wasn't because she mm. was like the little voice in Andy's ear mm. while Nigel was Andy's fairy godfather. Yeah. Yeah. Emily was a, yeah, because you kind of, I was kind of like to myself, so she's not like a main character, but she's a massive part. Although yeah. I don't know what they were doing with this blue eyeshadow they had her at one point. Oh, I know. That was so was 80s. Like, <laughs> I know. I know. And it's when you think of the Emily Blunt now and the Emily Blunt there, like very different. I mean, well, she, she plays the role, role in Hollywood. For, yeah. Yeah. She, I mean, and she plays her perfectly. this was also Anne Hathaway's first role, first lead role in a film that was targeted at adults. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, because I didn't prior to this, she'd been in films like The Princess Diaries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, so I this thought they was kind of her breakout role as well. Them them two worked well off each other. And I, I, like, I mean, Emily was a bitch to her. You know, she was a bitch to her for a lot of it. Yeah, but then like, I think that that was partly to do with the fact that she literally survived on a, a, bl- a, a tiny cube of cheese whenever she decided she was going to pass out. I think it's, I just think it's the industry. I just oh, yeah. Think it's, I just think it's, it's, it's like you, like you said there, she, you know, she wants to be Miranda and, um, you know, that was the way Miranda spoke to everyone. And, you know, I think that's the way people think in that industry. That's just what you do. It was just everybody was just ugly for, what for did you the think fashion of... industry. Ugly. Yeah. What did you think of the other relationships and the other characters in the film, though? So the one thing I kind of thought of this time round, which I hadn't really thought of as much before. I kind of did a little bit, but this time I really like, you know, the way sometimes you really home in on something a bit different. Absolutely. And for me, it was uh, Nate and Andy and Andy's friends. Not not the guy that was in love with Miranda, the uh, the, the girl. Lily. I can't remember. Her, what was her name? Lily. Lily. Um, and I thought them two were the most unsupportive boyfriend and friend. All they were worried about is what it was for them. They didn't seem to get that uh, Andy was trying to get somewhere. And the fact that she did have to take this job seriously. And she was told 
like if you mess this up because remember at the beginning they say she works for tv guide now yeah so like miranda Priestley could ruin or make your life and she knew this but they were just so worried about how her being busy despite the fact they were happy to she was happy to take that 1900 dollars bag yeah but they just and kept worrying the about how it, all the other samples yeah exactly how it just affected them and I remember at one point she apologized to Nate for one bit because he was having a little hissy fit. And I thought, would you all grow up? You've got your job in your gallery. You've got your job with your chef in. She's trying to now make her job. She's doing a crap job. She's getting treated like rubbish. But she And she knows. gets paid so badly that she still can't afford to make rent. Yeah, her dad has to help her. But, you know, she's doing all this to become this next person that she wants to be, this next job she wants. And you're all going, oh, but you're not around. I thought, oh, grow up. You're not friends. They were terrible. Oh, my yeah. God. So it was all about them. And she she was a typical woman then where she was like, oh, I'm sorry, Nate. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. You grow up. Oh, annoyed yeah, me. Yeah, that was so one much. thing with Lily. When mm. they were in the gallery and they yeah. um, Andy had shown up and she was looking at all of Lily's, the, Lily's exhibit and mm. Christian was there. And he kisses her on the cheek. Yeah. And Lily says, you're not the person I've known for 16 years. It's like, yeah, because she's grown, she's changed. Did you want her to stay the same so she didn't have a job? Well, that's exact. I think what that's what it is, is sometimes when you're in, whether it's friendships or a relationship, sometimes the person outgrows that friendship and that relationship. And yeah. like to me, Nate and Lily were holding her back because there, the they weren't thing supportive. Is, yeah, there was this. Uh, that's the thing. I mean, the only time he was supportive of her was when she said, "I'm going to quit." Oh, he loved that. that was didn't the he? One time he said yeah. he was he was supportive of her. Yeah, and at, yeah. Uh, even at the end of the film, when she says when she's um going for a job interview and he says oh I've just been for a job interview and I'm I'm moving to Boston and she says oh I'll miss your grilled cheese sandwiches and he says mm. oh they still have Yarlsberg in Boston I'm sure it's like so he automatically despite the fact that they're on a break he's expecting her to drop everything and move to Boston with him there's none of this oh what job have you interviewed for or how are things going or I'm really sorry things ended that way it's all immediately Oh, well, you can move to Boston with me then. It's like, excuse me? Yeah. No, I, d- I didn't like him in this and I didn't like Lily. I just thought that they were extremely selfish and it was what they wanted that mattered and not the fact that Andy was trying to, you know, make. And yeah. the, you know, the thing is, like at the end of the day, like when they were trying to, the phone was ringing, it was Miranda and they wouldn't let her have the phone. I thought that was They were a basically dick playing keep away. Yeah, Oh, yeah, exactly. I agree with you. Yeah, and then they were like, when she went, you guys don't need to be such assholes. And they looked at her as if like, us? Us yeah. assholes? The cheek of it like. And it was just, yeah, I I thought, I felt, I did feel sorry for Andy. So at the beginning, like you said, you're kind of like, you know, you're just, like she looked, I'm not being funny. Even if she weren't, which she wasn't, I mean, in the fashion industry, she made zero effort. Like the way she dressed was like, mm. So there was no effort there. And even if you're not into fashion, especially the first few days at work, what I always do if I go into an office, I go in, present myself very well, and then I scan the room and you get an idea of what you're allowed to wear. So you walk oh, in, God, you're like, so do I. actually, I could stick on a pair of jeans and t-shirt or a pair of leggings and a long top, or I need to wear a tie and try, you know, depending on what yeah. you wear and stuff like that, you know. So you go in and you suss it out. That's the first thing you do. But like you said, she went in and she was just like, you know, a bag lady, basically, like you look an absolute mess. Um, I think I the perfect she... comparison of that was at the beginning of the film where they show her getting ready for yeah. her in for her interview. Yeah. She's going to an interview and she hasn't made any the the biggest effort she's gone to is cleaning her teeth. When and having got an onion these... bagel. <laughs> yeah, and had an onion bagel. And that's one of my favorite lines from him. Yeah. Can I smell an onion bagel? <laughs> but then you've got all of these people who are going to their daily job at the magazine yeah. and yeah. they're doing their hair, putting on mascara and lipstick yeah. and picking out their clothes really carefully so that they fit in. And that's mm. what it is. It's about yeah. not standing out to the point that you're drawing too much attention to yourself. And that's where she went wrong. Especially in that place. 
But um, yeah. Yeah. So like I, I do, I think with her, she did grow in it. And there were certain things like where she wasn't different to Miranda in the sense that um, the, the parish trip, this I've got no choice. And while I don't agree, you've always got a choice. But I also agree with the fact that she didn't because like, so take your job. Some days you're like, I don't want to do it. I'm not doing it. I want to, you know, just everyone can go do one, which you have a choice to do. But you know that if you do that, you could lose your job. Then how do you pay your rent? And that's the thing. While Andy did have a choice, she also didn't because she needs that job. And I think that's what was fair when they kept on saying, like, she says to Nate at one point, I didn't have a choice when she had to go to the evening thing. Oh, you didn't yeah. have a choice, did you not? You did. You did. A no. Like when you go to work, Nate, as your chef and you don't feel like working that day, you have a choice on whether you leave or not. But you don't because it's your job. So yeah, you, exactly. While I you think... do have a choice, you also don't. There's too much of a consequence to the choice. Well, that's exactly. I mean, they had those drinks after she got the job and she's talking mm. with her friends and they're celebrating. And they yeah. all toast, here's to jobs that pay our rent. Yeah. They are the exactly. key words that pay our mm. rent. And that yeah. is the thing that I think that uh, Lily and Nate start to forget as... Yeah. Andy grows into the role and she's getting more phone calls from Miranda and that key point where Miranda actually remembers her name yeah yeah that's the moment, moment where you know things are going to twist and I think that this is something that Emily points out to her and she actually says and I wrote it down you sold your soul the day you put on your first Jimmy Choo's I saw it yeah mm. And she's not wrong no. because when even as she's talking to Lily and saying about Nate, that she's going to be late to Nate's party, the first yeah. thing she's she's talking to her and she sees Nigel with that dress and yeah. she puts her hand over the phone and says, oh, that's is that's gorgeous. Yeah. She interrupts a conversation with her friend, but all her yeah. friend is concerned with is not why she's going to be late, but the fact that she's being selfish in being late. Well, exactly. And also she at that party when she's leaving, she has a chance to meet that guy from the New Yorker, doesn't she? Yeah. Remember, because and, and she doesn't do it. You know, and that could cause she she wants to go to Nate's thing. So, you know, she makes sacrifices for other people. But the others just expect her to constantly like they they don't give her any sort of support. They're like the worst no. friends ever and boyfriend, like none at all. Oh, it's, I it's agree. Quite embarrassing at some points. And there are articles that actually cite Nate as the villain in this film over Miranda. Oh, I thought he was a villain. So I I thought he was like I wouldn't. Yeah. To me, that's not a partner. That's not, no. That's he's not a partner absolutely. At all. He's he's supportive in the beginning. Mm. And then when she, as she starts to grow and change, which as an adult and a young adult, especially you should, because otherwise mm. you're just going to be eternally the same person you were at college, which isn't necessarily a good thing. As soon as he starts to notice these changes, I mean, the way that she is, that Lily says to her, oh, no, actually, no, Lily doesn't. Nate says to her about, Oh, yeah, it's all shoes and handbags and dresses or shoes and purses mm. and dresses. Yeah. That's not what it's about. And it's it's really frustrating that they can't see that it's about career progression. And this is the way that she is going to get to her dream role. And I'll tell you one time he is very supportive of her, though, when he te says to her, I liked the old clothes. And then she goes, oh, so you don't like this and shows him his lawn her lingerie. He's bloody into it then, isn't he? Oh, remember that yeah, yeah exactly and I when I saw that I was like oh you idiot you don't like the old clothes what about this new sexy piece of lingerie oh yeah I like that thinking what is dick <laughs> <laughs> I love the way that you're muttering that because you know I'm gonna have to bleep it out <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no I, I, one one scene I absolutely love and it's when so well, there's kind of two so first of all I like it when Miranda looks back at uh Andy when she's in she's not really I really likes the outfit with the dress and the long coat 
and you can see that she's kind of like a bit shocked at the way Andy is dressed because she's not yeah. in her normal clothes. But the next one I love is basically, it's almost like because Andy's like really adapting to this job and she's doing a good job and all that kind of stuff. And then obviously Andy goes to the house and she sees her at her vulnerable state when she's arguing with her husband. It's like I it's almost like Miranda wants to prove that she can get the better of Andy. So she gives her that impossible task of getting the unpublished Harry Potter manuscript. And I love it when she finds out that uh, Andy has done it and the kids have it and she gives her a copy. And she's like, like, she can't even really be like, oh, my God, thank you. She just kind of goes, all right, that's all. And then she turns around and then she swings back on her chair and grabs her coffee, but looks over back and around I love that scene because it's just like you can tell that Andy's beat her there because she didn't it, expect she, her to she, no she no one you know I mean I knew she would in the film because you're like there's no way they'd throw that in there for her not to be able to do it especially you knew not she was gonna do it yeah especially not at that point in this at that point no. in the the um timing but I just I do I just love how like Andy kind of sometimes keeps shocking her and surprising her first of all with the clothes and then with, with this thing with the uh, Harry Potter book but the way she just kind of turns around and looks over her shoulder and grabs her coffee she's almost annoyed that she did it you know I what think I that's next the, that for me is the point where you realize Andy knows that this is just a job Mm. it's she's only doing it because she wants to get somewhere else but yeah. she knows that if she says that she's not going to get anywhere and that mm. for me is the, is the turning point because while everybody else is looking at her and going oh well you've changed too much you're too different she knows that she's putting things at risk and I think Nigel puts it in perspective for her and she's talking about how her personal life is falling apart and he says come back to me when it's fallen completely that's when it's time for a promotion and he's mm. so aware of it yet he yeah. does nothing himself to get out of it and his end the ending for him oh, kind of breaks my, my heart a bit because yeah. you know Miranda's thrown him under a bus yeah and and as Andy points out when he says she'll get she'll pay me back and Andy asks him will she yeah, are you sure about that? And he, I think he says, I have to, or I have to believe or something. Yeah. 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 That was, that was horrible because what, what, what got me about that scene was how we had saw him, seen him talking to Andy and he's like, I'm, you know, I finally get to call the shots. Like he was so excited. Yeah. And then when he was sat there, she was going, Miranda was like, and I'm bringing on this person, a long time friend, been by my side. And he's got the biggest smile on his face because any minute now, she's going to say his name. Yeah. And then when she says Jacqueline's name, who's someone that she doesn't even like, it's just like, oh, you bitch. Like that was. She's thrown him under a bus yeah. to save her own job. And the mm. thing is, you know from the very beginning that at any opportunity, she'll sling you right under that semi. Yeah. To save herself. Yeah. Yeah. So she she wasn't like Miranda wasn't a good person. She was do you know what Miranda was? She was good at her job. She was good very at very good at her job. What she did. That was it. But when it comes to like, you know, and if if I think if you if your job turns you into an absolute beep then <laughs> I was going to say something else, in there but I won't. Me. Yes. I'll put it in there for you. But if, if that's what you're doing, then, no, then that's you. But that's you anyway, I think. I think if you do that, that's always been in you. This job just brought it out because there is no way in this world that I would ever act like her, no matter what position I had. I could literally be the Queen of England and I still wouldn't act like that. I'd be going around asking the ser uh, the, the the servants, do, do, do you want a cup of tea? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? I just, I, I'd be like, Andy, do you want me to get you a coffee while I'm out? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? It just, yeah. I just, I, I, I the, the, the people in this film, apart from Nigel, Nigel was very honest because I love, I love it when she goes to him because she stormed out at that stage because she was crying because Miranda said something to her. And he's Miranda basically told like, she oh, was disappointed. Yeah, that was disappointing. That's what it was, yeah. And like, he's basically like, and boo hoo. Stop complaining. Stop moaning. He tells her. Here. Yeah. He tells her she's a whiner. Yeah. And I, I the thing is, brilliant. I mean, he tell, he's the one who tells her things as they are. 
and says from the minute you've been you got here you've been looking down on this job Mm -hmm. and that's her mistake and he's not wrong I mean okay so it's not where she wanted to be she wanted to be working for the New Yorker or the New York Times or whatever else but that's every journalist's dream I wanted to work for the Telegraph when I was 18 yeah yeah no, I, I like. I think everyone needs a Nigel because you know, we we're all guilty of like having a whinge and a moan. And sometimes, like, I wish that's what we did. I wish when people were moaning. I don't mean like I'm having a bad day at work and I just need to. But like, we we, we can all moan and whinge and go over over uh, over the top a bit. But I do wish sometimes that we could just turn and go, oh, shut up. Oh, we just stop your moaning. If you don't like it, then go and do something else. But we don't. But he does. Yeah. You know? I mean, exactly. I would speak to people like that, but they couldn't handle it. <laughs> 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 they start crying <laughs> no really uh <laughs> what about christian oh what a sleaze oh i did not like him at all you Ew. see i preferred him to nate i didn't like him i know i didn't like both of them see i think that he understood her her ambitions and he was using them to his own oh, ends yes. He was a piece of work. No, I didn't. I didn't like him at all. And when they got together at the end and stuff like that, and the way he was like, you know, and I, what did I did enjoy is because he was like, oh, Jacqueline's going to be the boss, and I'm coming in as like her right hand man type thing. And then his face when he I realized, he'd been, oh, that was brilliant. I loved it. No, I thought he was straight off because I can't remember what it was, but I think it's when they first met. He kind of said something to her, like he was telling her what's he what told her that working for um for Miranda was a mistake yeah and I thought you don't even know this girl why why are you telling her what to shut up like I just I just didn't like him straight away and I I don't mind him as an actor and I, 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 yeah but in this I was like nah he, he wasn't he wasn't nice I didn't like him in this tour I thought he was a right sleazy but they all were <laughs> like they all not all of them but like the 98 percent of them there were, in very this were just few very unlikable there were very very few characters in this who had overall redeeming qualities. You've mm. got Nigel, you've got Doug, and Doug. oh yeah, 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 Doug, yeah, and uh, you've got Nigel, and you've got, got Doug. Doug. <laughs> I did. Um, I will say though, at the end, Emily kind of has a little bit because when she rings her up for a favor and she's like, "You want a favor?" and she goes, "Well, I have to take them all in because they're just, you know, drown me type thing." And then she turns around and says to the girl, "You've got big shoes to fill." So I yeah. think she liked her, and I think Miranda liked her, but they just couldn't. They could have had a good friend in Andy. Both of them could have had a good friend, yeah. a real friend in Andy. One of the probably you know, the really more funny real than is, anyone else. There is a sequel to the book, yeah, called Revenge Wears Prada, in which Andy and Emily are mm. business partners in a wedding magazine. Yeah, written by the same author. Apparently, the book is dreadful, but there is a yeah. sequel. Oh, in which well. they are partners. So they do end up having some kind of friendship. I'm not sure how it ends because I haven't read it. However, I do know that there is that there is a sequel. And one of the things I will say is the book is the book, The Devil Wears Prada, has a very much more ambiguous ending than the film. Oh, okay. There is no definitive, though Andy does actually get fired by Miranda for shouting at her there is no definitive I'm done with this mm. as there is in the film yeah all right okay I liked the ending though I think Andy yeah kind of apparently the end I mean apparently the ending of the film is much better because there is no ambiguity it is a yeah. definitive no I'm not having this anymore and she throws the phone away mm in a beautiful fountain yeah. in the middle of Paris. Uh, <clears throat> but it is it is far more definite that it that she is done with Miranda at that point in the film. Yeah. Yeah, I did like the ending and like when Miranda turns around and realizes she's not there and she's almost like, you know, like she needs Andy. You know, she needs far more in a way her. than Andy needs her. Oh yeah. Yeah. At that and point. I like when we see them at the end and they both see each other. And she waves to her and 
Miranda obviously gives her that look, but then she gets in the car and smiles. So I, I, I yeah, I kind of feel like you guys should have just all had a chat. You could have all, you've been a nice little threesome, you lot, getting on, going for dinner yeah. and stuff. Without Nate. <laughs> Without, oh God, yeah, Nate. <laughs> See, that was the thing. I mean, I didn't like Nate from the get-go because no. he had, I mean, the thing, when they broke up or they took mm. their break, he was so dismissive of everything as mm. though, oh, we're, all of these things, oh, it's just shoes and purses and dresses. And, oh, and now you're, we're, um, we've got nothing in common anymore. It's like, I was, the last time I checked, you didn't have to have everything in common in order to be together. In fact, oh, me your differences can sometimes, in common. yeah, your differences mm. can sometimes make it work far better because there's no competition. Yeah, we have nothing in, nothing in common, me and my partner. <laughs> really nothing. Yeah, because it what annoyed me there though, and I was like, Andy, why? And she turned around and she said to him, she goes, Oh, Nate, you were right all along. She told him he was right about everything. And I was like, don't tell him that because his little smug little face going, Yeah, I was, yeah. I was so amazing. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm the man and I'm always right. Oh, that was a bit <laughs> That's what he was. That's yeah, what, I know. That's what he was. He was that way in it. Like, and Christian was like that as well. But you know, Doug and Nigel weren't. But yeah, oh yeah. But then vile. Doug and Nigel were both interested in men. Yeah, we do love the gay men. They're nicer. <laughs> I, out of all of her friends, I think Doug was the only one I'd want to hang out with. Yeah, and he got the industry. As well, he he understood it a lot more than the others, and he was just happy to get the free stuff as well. Uh, but he was also but yeah. kind of happy for her ambition. Mm. Not yeah. once did he criticize her. I mean, he went along with the stupid keep away game with the phone, yeah. but at the same time, he was far less boisterous, and he was also far less mouthy when things didn't go the way everybody else wanted them to. No, exactly. Whereas the other two were like throwing their toys out the pram. Exactly. So I think that that was definitely Nate's failing and Lily was not a good friend at all. I did find no. it quite amusing that in so many ways, Andy was desperately trying to find some kind of connection with the people in the office as well. It was as <laughs> though she didn't realize that th this was not the workplace where everyone was friends. Yeah, when she was saying, uh, oh, this weekend, I'm going to go to this. Yeah. Are you doing anything fun? Yes. <laughs> just like, just kind of walks out. It's like, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. So there's, okay. there's none of that. Exactly. It's kind of, oh, okay, great. I'm not going to talk to you about that again, ever. But there, I yeah. think that there was that competition between the two of them. Because even though Andy had outwardly outwardly changed, I don't think she had inwardly. No, she was just doing her job and like she wasn't available to people when they wanted her to be. And I think that was the problem. It wasn't that she had, you know, you have all the time in the world when you're at uni. Like I went back to uni as a mature student. So I was like in my thirties when I went back to uni. And I remember some of the students going, oh my God, this is so hard. I'm like, honestly, when you start working, this will be the best time of your life. So when they yep. were students and all that kind of stuff, they had the time to have fun and just chat. Whereas now, you know, unfortunately, reality sets in and you have to become an adult. And that means dealing with certain people that means your job is kind of like 24 seven, you know? Yeah. And it also and just... means um, you also have all the additional responsibilities that you don't have when you're working full time or you've got kids You've got, there are certain things that you can't do at the same time as you would have done them if no. you weren't working, if you were at uni or you were at school. Like all the, all the things that I used to do when I was, um, when I was unemployed, when I was caring for my grandmother, like I would do my laundry during the day and I'd clear up the house and I'd get the vacuuming done. I now have to do all of that either before I start work at nine or on the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I remember like when I had Riley and li just just little things for me, like where 
I need to go to the shop. Right. Okay. Let's pack up the house and bring, you know, just all these things start to change in your life. And like you said, you can only do things at certain times of the day. I can, I can do things at certain times of the day, but at night I would never like take a Hoover out at seven o'clock. I would never, you know, put the washing machine on at seven o'clock, you know, that things like that. Cause, cause Riley's gone to bed. So yeah. you have to change your life and you're not, like you said, you're not as available. Like sometimes me and you are meant to do something at night like with the recording or something or have a chat and I have to cancel because she won't go to bed, you know, things like that. So yeah. Or I have to cancel because it's a Tuesday evening and work ran long. I didn't get home until half past six and I'm absolutely shattered. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas if we were all like free and didn't have to worry about any of these things, then that's it. All of these things. It's like with certain jobs, yes, you have the nine to five and it is Hmm. legitimately nine to five. And with other jobs, it starts out as being nine to five. And then slowly, five becomes six, six becomes half past six, and occasionally becomes seven. And nine becomes half past eight. And then you don't get a lunch break. And you have to adapt to these things. Uh, Yeah, exactly. You have to adapt to these things. And that's what is happening with Andy and her job. Whereas for some for some unknown reason, her partner is working in a job that seems to have regular hours, even though he's working in a, a kitchen, which yeah, always I always free. thought was huh? <laughs> he's, and he's always, always free. <laughs> yeah, unusually, because I've known people who've trained as chefs and they work horrific hours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to work in the hospitality industry and the you know you know yourself the hours are are terrible so yeah yeah, I just I just think they wanted it their way and I think what it was is that she was always available for what they wanted and I think sometimes with people when you take something away not not like to be mean or anything just because I have to work people don't like that so no it was very childish it was it was like they were those two were like teenagers you know yeah, I that's agree. And that I think that's the thing. With in reality, Andy had started a new job. She was in a new city, mm-hmm. probably completely out of her comfort zone. She expected the support of her partner and her friends in moving into a career, into a job that she wasn't in the industry that she really wanted to be in and understood. Mm. And all she's getting is absolute torment because she has had to change in order to fit in with to be fair a location that she spends more time in than she spends anywhere else because yeah being honest you spend far more of your waking hours during the week in your workplace than you do at home and yeah. especially when you're doing Andy's job. I mean, Andy is stuck in, she's between a rock and a hard place because she's got mm. a boss who is incredibly demanding and is basically a white witch. Well, actually, I wouldn't even say she's a white witch. I'd say she's a witch. And she's working with colleagues who constantly, they they obviously know somebody who deserves her job better than she does um, because they fit the mold far better than Andy does. Mm. But... So she's constantly having to battle against their opinion of her. She's battling against Miranda's opinion of her and constantly having to prove herself. And then at the other end of the spectrum, she's got Christian who's telling her that he can get her the career he she wants to have if she'll basically, well, quite blatantly at the end of it, sleep with him. Um, though that, that, yeah, no, your face says it all. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit grimy and then she's got her long-term boyfriend and friends that have known her for over a decade telling her that she's changed to the point where she's unrecognizable and they aren't sure if they like her anymore so she's fighting a losing battle on all fronts yeah she's got she's got nowhere to go basically exactly where she goes somebody's at her for something and nobody seems to worry about what she needs no you know so if you were going to summarize this film for somebody how would you summarize it how would I summarize it um yeah young girl wants a job as a journalist but ends up working with a bunch of bitches 
(laughs) (laughs) Demanding, over the top, everybody needs to calm down. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's just like. I know because even Emily goes, I never thought I'd ever ever have to say this to anyone apart from me, but you really need to calm down. <laughs> you know, it's just, I suppose say one thing when I was watching it, I, because I text my friend Harry when I was, when I was watching it and I said, because I was looking at all the outfits and stuff like that, because, you know, sometimes I wish I dressed up a bit more during the day and I don't mean like I'm going to a dinner but just made a bit more yeah. of an effort like because I've got too used to just throwing on something and walking out the door yeah hello I'm, I was like, I'm wearing oh. a blanket right now yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> and I, I was like I'd love to just have had that experience because I have lived in America but I lived in Boston and I was like I, I always wanted to experience living in New York and I wanted to experience getting dressed up and going to a good office job and all that kind of stuff like that type of I don't know why environment but I was only like when I thought like this I was in my 20s so you know yeah I'm not the age I am now but that that's one thing I was like there was something about it that made me wish I had done it when I was younger the fast pace like I wouldn't I wouldn't have the tolerance when you for think it about it when this film came out we were 32 yeah yeah so I could have done it then, but I I just wouldn't have lasted because I wouldn't have taken that. I wouldn't have taken anyone speaking to me that way, you know. It's so it's, I mean, it's a really good film, and I would highly suggest watching it. But it's just messed up that because the sad thing is, you know that this goes on. Oh, absolutely. Like if this is based on Anna Winter, then she needs to like you know, she needs to check herself, you know. <laughs> You're not, you're not like, you know, the queen, like you just, I don't even think the queen would bloody act like that. It's just like, you know, have a bit of patience, calm down. And if you want a cup of coffee, the kettle's over there. Stop sending oh, do you people. be serious. They had to go to Starbucks and I don't oh, understand why Starbucks was such hot. a thing because I don't, I honestly can honestly say, I don't understand why Starbucks is such a thing anywhere because even when I drank coffee, I wasn't a massive fan of Starbucks coffee. No, Starbucks was always mine. I prefer that over all of them. That's the thing you see. I preferred a, um, there was a beautiful little Turkish place around the corner from where I used to work and they did the best coffee. So good. Far better than Starbucks and a lot cheaper. Yeah, no, I know they they placed it on. Uh, they put Starbucks on in this a lot. They must have been sponsored by it or something. Yeah, I think they probably got some yeah. kind of product placement deal with them. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it. I mean, it's a fun film. It's a great film. And if you're thinking of getting into the fashion industry, I'd watch this and see. Could you? Are you able for it? Because a lot of people wouldn't be able for that job. You you wouldn't yeah. be able to do that job. <laughs> You'd be able to do the job. You wouldn't be able to deal with the people. No. Oh God, no. I can't deal with no. people in general. Uh, yeah. The, the, I, one of the interesting things about this is this film had one of the most, one of the highest budgets when it came to costumes because oh, yeah. of all I the designer that. wear. In fact, yeah. at the time that the film came out, it had the most expensive costume budget of I, any I film. That. I believe that. I mean, the clothes oh, yeah. were, you can't deny the clothes were stunning. I mean, some of those dresses were so beautiful. Yeah, I like some of the outfits. I'm not a big fan of that kind of stuff, to be honest with you. I like some of the outfits that Anna I mean, wore. I'd never she wear them really nice because things. I'm sure, I'm sorry, I'm short and dumpy. I'd never be anything. I'm, I mean, I'm not even five foot. So I'd never be tall enough to carry off any of she's those really clothes. Not. I think not she's even the boots. I saw her. Um. <laughs> I'm four foot 11. Come on. If I drop an inch, yeah. I'm stuffed. Uh, only drop five inches, and I'm a, I'm actually legitimately a dwarf. Um, <laughs> Bless you are very short. <laughs> I know, but, but um, I did love the shoes and the clothes, and I'd never dream of wearing any of them. But I think they're beautiful. Yeah, you I could mean, wear I, some I of look Andy's at the Christian clothes. Louboutin, huh? You could wear some of Andy's clothes. Why no, you? no, they needed long body and long legs. And I I've got neither. I wear some clothes, and I'm I'm only five two. I it's amazing how the difference. Stuff. It's amazing the difference three inches makes. And yeah, I could have said that in so many different ways that didn't sound <laughs> rude. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying anything about men. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't at all. But 
the sh- I, I actually occasionally will go to Christian Louboutin website just to look at the shoes, knowing I could never wear them because I've got very wide feet. But I, I can't help but look at some of them because they are so pretty. What did you think? See, I, I actually did this film in, I did a, a module because I did a film degree and I did uh, in film and music and I did this film for the music because I really liked the music in it. What did you think Very of the music? In it? <laughs> yeah, it was a great soundtrack. And I mean, when it you hear Madonna, you can't really go go wrong, can you? But um, yeah, it was a it was a good soundtrack. I thought they did. I thought they used. I the think music it well fit. It. it really did fit the film when the music that played at the specific moments. It mm. was appropriate. Sometimes you watch something and you think, "Why did they play that then?" Because it's jarring and it didn't fit. Whereas every single song or piece of music that they played yeah. fit the moment fit. that it was playing, yeah. which I think is a really is a really good <laughs> a really good thing for a, a um for the music editor and the sound coordinator mm. to be able yeah. to do because they can't always do it. Um, and one thing, what did you think of the casting of Mel Street for? Oh, for Miranda Priestley, really? She was superb. This actually garnered her another Oscar nomination. Oh, she's just so good. She's just, it's weird because I was watching her on Graham Norton and she's just so, like, that. there's this story out about her. Um, she's working with Jennifer Lawrence and, uh, oh, what's his name? You're one from Superbad um, that's in the Wolf of Wall Street, Jonah Hill and that like that. And yeah. they're like calling her the goat, you know, greatest of all time. Yeah. And, um, Jennifer Lawrence was telling the story where uh, Meryl Streep's like, yeah, yeah, come on, the the old goat. She thought they were just going, oh, look at the old lady. Oh, come on, the old goat. (laughs) And they were like, you do know what that means? And she's like, yeah, the old goat. And then I know, greatest of all time. She's like, oh, like she's just so sweet. And like, I mean, I love uh, Meryl Streep and basically nearly everything she does. I just adore her. But in this, she's just like that whole you know when she purses her lips because she doesn't she really hates something disapproves she of a collection this, oh she's just got a look that would cut through ice she's just oh brilliant perfect but then, i couldn't imagine anyone else doing that role that's the thing i mean her character when i watched this her character reminds me very much of the character she played in the iron lady when she played margaret thatcher, margaret thatcher. I because she was there is something about this <laughs> yeah there's something about both of these characters that mm. is a huge contrast to characters that she's played in, especially things like Mamma Mia. Yeah, yeah. And well, I, I mean, her, that's like... a total contrast. And when she's in this, you don't like her, but you know you're not meant to like her anyway. But when no. she plays the vulnerable moment where she yeah. is telling Andy that Snoop Dogg needs to be on their table at the evening gala because her husband's not showing up. She just carries on. And then she says, oh, I'll need to speak with Leslie to sort out how it's handled in the press because Mm. I'm worried about my girls. So she has got the heart, but she doesn't want to show any vulnerability because I think Mm. that she's so, it's so ingrained in her. If she shows any vulnerability, She's exposing a nerve which will give somebody else a chance to cut her out. Yeah, because especially in this industry as well. Yeah. But yeah, I just thought she... I mean, my favourite... One of my favourite roles with her is Bridges of Madison County. I love that film. I absolutely love that film. That's an amazing film. But yeah, she uh, she's just brilliant in this. Yeah, <laughs> but an I absolute like her horror of a person. <laughs> Yeah, oh, she was an absolute nightmare. But then, as we've already established, pretty much every yeah. single character in this, barring yeah. Nigel and Doug, were not the nicest people anyway. Yeah. I mean, Andy, you can feel for, but at the same time, there are certain elements of her character that you just don't like anyway. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Nigel's definitely my favourite, which is easy oh, yeah. because it's Stanley Tucci. But yeah. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So what? how many stars would you give this? I'd give this a solid four out of five. Yeah, see, I'd give it a, probably a 4.25. Yeah, I do like this. But then I think that the um, costume and jewellery and accessories qualify the extra 2.5. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, my child just come in there to give me a hug. Um, 
yeah, no, I just, I, it's a, it's a good film. I'm glad they didn't make the sequel from what you said. It didn't, it wouldn't yeah. sound like um, a great one, but uh, yeah, no, I'd highly recommend this. It was like, I sat last night, I was in bed last night cause I was meant to be doing something else. And um, I didn't know if I'd have time to watch this for this recording, but I've seen it so many times. I was happy with, the, you know, with talking about it, but I was like, oh, what am I going to do for the evening? And I went and got myself a glass of wine I put on my electric blanket. I got into bed and I was watching this and I was like, I was in my element. You, you have those days where you're just like, I'm so content right now. Yes. Like life is good right now. And that that's what that film was to me last night. I just sat in bed, my glass of wine and I have a telly on in bed. And I was like, ah, what else would you be doing on a Friday night? <laughs> See, that's me. Last night, because I was quite tired, I watched... The remainder of The Class of 07, which has a killer mm. soundtrack. It's a TV yeah. series based during the apo- based during an apocalypse. And it's Australian. Yeah. And it's I would recommend it if you like that kind of stuff. But it, and it's quite it's kind of um uh Lord of the Flies-esque in many ways. Okay. And I watched that and then I went to bed with a Joanna Lindsay and my book torch. And as I yeah. said, I mean, though I haven't been reading the books that I really want to talk about, I have yeah. still been reading. I've yeah. read six Joanna Lindsay's since Wednesday. Oh, well, that's good. But they're easy. Well, then maybe that'll get you back into it. So that's what, that, see, that's what I'm hoping. This is my slump killer, or I'm hoping it is. And I did end up buying five more yesterday. Or maybe we'll just do a season of... Being bookish goes to the movies where I come on and talk to you about the films that I can't talk about on my podcast because they're not horror. I'm like, Ray, yeah. Oh, don't do a book. Do this. Do this. <laughs> yeah. Do Confessions of a Shopaholic. <laughs> no, I don't know what I'd pick next. Hmm. No, I have a think. <laughs> See, that's what I'm hoping is. I mean, there are a couple of films that are very obviously based on books. Mm. I mean, in fact, there's, there's, a large number of films that are based on books the films are normally slightly inferior there are a few cases I mean this was a very good see we were trying to figure out uh, when we did your episode on I know what you did last summer Mm. and when we did my episode practical magic if there were cases where the book was better than the film and I struggled to think of any and I can honestly say this is probably better than the book oh that's good so people should go. I think film. partially because Meryl Streep is incredible mm-hmm. and Stanley Tucci is a massive bonus, but also because the ending is far cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good ending. And you get that picture of who the characters are. And for me, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, so def- I wouldn't I say don't recommend. read the book. Yeah. But watch the film. But I would definitely say watch the film if you haven't, because it does give you a good idea of what's in the book anyway. But it also gives you a far clearer depiction of the characterization. And Miranda Priestley just leaps off the page in the film, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, where can people find you? Um, Well, I'm at my house upstairs. (laughs) Ha ha, you know what I mean. Online, where can people find you <laughs> for your podcast? I'm not giving you my address. Um, I am on Twitter as a Nightmare Pod. And am I a Nightmare Pod on TikTok? I think that's what my name yes. is, isn't it? Yeah, uh, when I use it. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast. So that's where you can find all my stuff. And uh, I do stuff on there with Ray. So Ray's on there as well. <laughs> And you've got Making a website a too. Sort I of. do, but that, I, I'm I'm kind of working on that at the moment. <laughs> that's once upon a nightmare, yeah. But yeah, I need to. Uh, that's my job for the next two weeks is to work on that. Well, there you go. So when mm. her website's finished, it's once upon a nightmare dot co dot uk. I believe. Yeah, dot com was gone. Yeah. Yeah, dot com is has been purchased by Sherilyn Kenyon. Yeah. And if any of you readers she out there it. recognize that name, she wrote the Dark Hunter books. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't know. Which that. I have read. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming on and talking about. I mean, this is an amazing film, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And no doubt we will find another opportunity to talk to go to the movies again. 
Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my <laughs> sly way of saying, Ray, you should really talk about this film. I'll come on and do it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's always a welcome when you're, as anybody who is a reader will know, when you hit that slump, it is really hard to come out of. And the last time I hit a bad slump, I was in it for an entire year. So here's hoping. If you've got any suggestions for weekly get me out of it. <laughs> yeah, the podcast I- will be gone if that happens again. <laughs> No, but I, I got, I've got had you come on my podcast when I just, you know, can't sit down and write a script. So I would get you to come on and do it. We, you know, I've done that as well. Watch a film just because I just can't focus on writing a whole script for it. So because yeah, it's easier exactly. when you've got someone to talk to because you don't. It is you know, indeed. I think it's just yeah. the worry that it's going to last for longer than a few yeah. weeks. So yeah. if anybody has any recommendations for books that get them out of a slump, maybe historical romance that isn't Bridgerton, because I've read all of those and they are in the charity shop um, <laughs> because I didn't like them. But if anybody likes Julie Garwood, Joanna Lindsay, Jude Devereaux, um, Judith McNaught and books of that ilk, then do pass your recommendations on to me because they seem to be helping slowly ease me out of that slump. But again, thank you to Lorraine for coming on and chatting to me about the 2006 film, The Devil Wears Prada, because it is amazing and it was great to have someone to talk to about it. Exactly. So this is me saying goodbye for now. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. Do it, dear. (laughs) Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening and thank you once again to Lorraine for being a guest on the episode. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any of the other podcatchers where you listen. You can follow me on Twitter at being underscore bookish, on Instagram at being bookish pod and on TikTok as being bookish reviews. Or you can check out my website beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week and hopefully that includes reading a new book, though I am going to be interviewing Claudia Klein, a new author, about her YA fantasy novel. So until next time, this is me saying farewell 